Hello, this is Mark Tully for many years, the BBC's daily correspondent. May I entreat you to switch off your mobile phones, and may I invite you to settle back and enjoy the amazing adventures of my remarkable aunt. Our story begins a decade before Ursula arrived in Nagaland. of our ancestors. Ancestors! Ancestors! A Naga goddess will rise to drive the British from our hills and rule over all who eat from the wooden platter. See, this sacred python will not crush me. never be captured. Tell my people I will return. I will return in such a disguise my enemies will never, never recognize me. Take her away. Tell them I will return. I will return. And shoot that ruddy python. One, two, one, two. Ah, good. Now, here are some of my nagas putting on a lively show for my cine camera. And they'll dance at the drop of a hat. Now, do take a look at the quality of their shawls. So very distinctive. Their weaving skills are simply superb. And the colours so strikingly rich. As for their character, I simply won't hear a word said against them. There are a few gin-swilling white tea planters who might brand them savages, but quite frankly, your average village naga is the nicest chap you could wish to meet. They are tactful and courteous and industrious and have a very high moral code. Their pleasure in life is derived from kindness, loyalty and friendship. Of course, they also took heads. And if you put a spear in a man's hand, the dancing can become very animated indeed. A bit like nuts in May, but with more attitude. Their passion for headhunting really was the only fly in the ointment. The Nagas were so splendidly wild back then. Dance like Nijinsky one minute and chop off her head the next. Ah, oh, yes. I can't tell you how deuce difficult it is not to join in. Of course, it never occurred to me that the one big occasion I should be called upon to dance like that in earnest would be at my own Naga wedding. You know, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford was awfully pleased with all my footage. Those wartime years up in the Naga Hills really were the very best of my life. Lights, please. And so, may I thank you so very much for listening. And may I say a huge thank you to my dear friend, Hilda Murrell, who has made this evening possible. <laughs> now, Trina, over to you. Thank you, Mother. Whenever I hear your, your tale, your incredible story, I always hear something new. 
Uh, I'm so proud. Now, oh, you must have a million questions you, you, you'd like to have answered. to marry me off to any clapped-out colonel who'd take this unfortunate frump off her hands. Especially with war on the way. Oh, well, I suppose that's one way of getting a passage to India. <laughs> oh, Ursula, how lovely to see you. Oh, Lexi, a friendly face. Don't tell me you're out head-hunting. Oh, certainly not. Mother does that for me, and if she gets a nibble, I do a runner. <laughs> Up to much. Um, spot of anthropological research for the pit rivers, cross cataloguing and such. Frankly, it's a bit of a bore. I'd much rather be on all fours digging up shards of pottery. Somewhere exotic. India would be. Oh, God. Who's Mother talking to now? That poor man, the leg of his, he can barely stand. Oh, that's broad and right. Assam rifles. You're safe there. Far too gone to see it. <laughs> How do you know him? My brother Ranald is in the civil service at Imphal. I'm going out there to keep house for him. Lots of very exotic tribes up there. Care to come? I'd say. Well, our car bumped and bustled along the road through really thick, low country jungle. Morning mist still lingering in places. We pulled up at a sentry post to show our papers. I was 23, and I have to admit, I thought of India entirely in terms of Delhi and the Taj Mahal. But this, this was wild. Thank you. Huge walls of great trees on either side, all straining up for the daylight, and creepers tangled in between. Bright banana trees, I'd never seen the like. And before us, mountains piled like accordion pleating. Suddenly, we began to climb. Zigzag, 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 the whole way up. We were still climbing. When we came round a bend, and my life changed forever. Lexi screeched to a halt to avoid a group of men in the road, and the sight of them was a shock. They didn't look at least a bit Indian, more Mongolian, almost Chinese, a bit like Gurkhas. Bright bead necklaces drooped down their bare chests, and short black kilts with three lines of cowrie shells and blue and green beetle wings wrapped around their hips, plaid edged with vivid colour hung across their coppery shoulders. Tall, solid, muscular. Then, two or three of them broke away from the group and shouted, Oh! A pui nanga hira gum delai. A pui nanga hira gum delai. And then we lurched off and they were gone. I must have sat like a fool, gaping, 
trying to snatch a memory from the very edge of my mind. I knew them. I was sure of it. But how, where, I did not know. It was absolute deja vu. I said, Lexi, who are those? Those, my dear Ursula, are Nagas. And at least two or three of them seem to think you are their goddess. Oh, my mother, you are a goddess. You are the greatest. None are greater than you. That kind of thing? Are you sure you've not been here before? It was terribly unfortunate for Mother. Terribly. Gaidenu had been around the same age. Tall, strong, sturdy. So, when a decade after her imprisonment, Mother turned up out of the blue in a form no one would recognise, some of the Nagas firmly believed Mother was their goddess come again. Others didn't. But enough did. Gaidenu used to complain that people wanted to worship her night and day, that she couldn't even take a, a bath in peace. Now it was Mother who could barely bathe undisturbed. I was taking a bath in my hut when in strolled a vague elderly gentleman with a chicken in a basket. I, at that moment, was standing up in my canvas tub in the all together. I didn't even have a bath towel. My only weapon was a cake of soup. So I threw it at him and scored a direct hit in his unguarded. Well, he was hustled away in no uncertain fashion, and I had to get out of the bath and retrieve the soap because I hadn't finished. <laughs> but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Mother yearned to, well, to do something useful. And for that, she required a permit from the senior district officer. <laughs> Civil service. Been out here since 1916 to nurture the Nagas. Well, the ones that will tolerate being nurtured, that is. We British only have a relationship with some of the tribes. There are excluded areas. My job is to defend our administered areas from exploitation to protect their race and their culture. And we get along pretty well, actually, considering their seasoned warriors in a fatherly sort of way. I mean, when I first came here, thousands of them volunteered to fight with us in Flanders, and there were very few complaints about the horrendous casualties. Remarkable people. And once in a blue moon, I get a letter from someone or other wanting to pop up to see them. The latest from someone called Bar. Come in. I was shown into his office. Graham Barr, reporting, sir. He took a quick glance and said, Good God! A woman! Ursula Violet Graham Barr, sir. Well, that puts a rather different picture on things. It can be desperately basic in those hills. Malaria, leeches, and worse... If I let you go up there, I'll be sending a stretcher party for you inside a week. But I simply have to go. From the moment I saw those Nagas, I knew this was my place. Quite frankly, I'm hooked on them. Hmm. Not sure the chaps at HQ would see it that way. Convince me. Anthropology. Qualifications. A keen amateur. And with a commission to take pictures of their customs and culture, 
pottery and weaving not previously recorded, I spent every last penny on a fell. And if I took medical supplies with me, I could be a walking dispensary for the sick and injured, Red Cross trained, badge to prove it, and... a picnic basket to keep the medicines in. You're more likely to need the medicines for yourself. <laughs> You're a pretty determined sort, aren't you? Bower, Bower. Hmm. Have you not heard of that Bower who captained one of those damn dangerous death-defying submarines in the 1418? <sighs> Father. Hmm. Somehow I'm not surprised. All right. You're on. <laughs> oh, but, um, there is one tricky thing. Some of the Nagas seem to think I'm some sort of regurgitated goddess. Guiding Lou. <laughs> She'll be behind bars for a very long time. Put her there, personally. That woman was a whole lot of trouble. But, see here. I'd quite like to know how much support she still has in far-flung quarters. So, the anthropology would be a perfect disguise for someone doing a bit of digging around on my behalf. And healing the sick might just about seal it for the superstitious. And if they must have a goddess, they may as well have a government one. <laughs> and with that, he winked. Henry out! <laughs> chaperone, of course, more of a bodyguard, really, to comply with British expectations. The Nagas were no trouble at all, but at least he could act as interpreter. The man chosen was Namkia Booing. Namkia, for short. <laughs> He was 30-something and had taken a government post under duress. He still wore the red cloth of authority, but he did have a tendency to keep resigning. He was certainly very intelligent, but it was an intelligence that worked along quite different lines to ours. He didn't believe a word in the goddess business, but he did have deep suspicions about Mother. What on earth? could a white woman be doing up here? It was only on a long journey they had their first worthwhile conversation. It's terribly good of you to take me on. <laughs> Must be a bit irksome for you having to put up with a Mem Sahib like me. <laughs> Why do you keep resigning your job? The quality of obedience. Hmm? The quality of obedience. I do not have it. And so I resigned. But because I speak English, Mr. Henry will not accept my resignation. So, I resigned again. I have resigned every day for the last 27 days. And then you arrived. I have to follow orders, but I will probably resign again tomorrow. <laughs> have you taken many heads? <laughs> we seldom take heads these days, but my ancestors did. A naga soul lives in his head, his power. So, if you are at war with another village and you chop off a man's head, you win the power of his soul for your own village. And there are other more practical reasons. <laughs> I suppose if you've got your enemy's head on a stick, you know the rest of him is going to come looking for you. <laughs> you have taken many heads. No, but, um, well, I have banged quite a few together from time to time. <laughs> you British say we must not take heads. 
Then you do much worse things. We only have small wars, a few heads chosen for their power. But you, you have census wars that kill anybody and everybody. The bones of hundreds of my Naga ancestors lie in a field somewhere you call Flanders. I speak to my ancestors and they say when the poppies flower, the petals are red with the blood of the British, but the centers are black with Naga blood. So how dare you British tell us how we should conduct ourselves? Hmm? You know, in my father's village, a young man was not permitted to marry unless he had taken a head first. So there was much competition for head hunting. It was great sport and it cut out the competition for the most beautiful women. <laughs> to be a good warrior, you had to take a head, kill a tiger and sleep with a mother and daughter without the one knowing about the other. <laughs> And, and which was the most dangerous? Hmm. A mother can be more ferocious than a tiger. <laughs> How far is this um, village we're going to? Mm. Two days. I will take you there. And then I will resign. <laughs> which became Mother's home village, stood high on a spur. I suppose there were about 80 bamboo houses along the main track that widened into a sort of square. Mother's camp was slightly outside the main village, perched high like an area above steep cliffs. It was newly built, but basic. Her only comforts were that canvas bar, a wind-up gramophone, and a collection of Lexi's Scottish folk music. enough and its position is out of a rhyme parcel but frankly the facilities need rearranging I mean look at that the H of P is directly opposite the kitchen door unhygienic on both counts still it can all wait my god what's that it's a storm that's what it is at half past one in the afternoon how dare it down the valley. I must grab that door before it blows away. Excuse me while I swear at the bloody thing. Gone. And now the whole house is leaning, groaning, and hail horizontal as big as golf balls. And hail, twigs, and shredded leaves are forcing their way through the walls and, and showering down on me. I can barely stand the whole house. Feels like it's going Can I run to? <sighs> Suddenly, the wind has dropped and the whole house is creaking itself back upright. I step outside to see the hail has killed every pig, goat and chicken in the village. Welcome to Nargaland! And then, Mother took ill with her first fever. She discovered... My drinking water! 
had not been boiled. I took to my camp bed in such a state, like an English rose with leaf rot. To my impotent fury, Namkia, who I was relying upon to nurse me better, just went out and got drunk. I really am ill, you know, Namkia. Please stay within call. But he just said, oh, take some of your medicine and get better. I'm resigning. <laughs> well, I was so blazing angry. I spent my lucid intervals that night rehearsing what I'd say to him if I lived till morning. When he returned, I rose from my pillow and let out what must have sounded like a dying curse. More swearing, I'm afraid. Well, it scared the daylights out of him. And after that, he nursed me royally. And when, when I was fully recovered, together we swore a blood bond. Sapui, you are my beloved sister. Your beloved sister. Here are some of Mother's press cuttings. She professed to be appalled by them. <laughs> and they were appalling, but <laughs> also amusing, which is why she kept them all. Oh, the, the American reports were the worst. Cal Cutter, 1939, files a news desk in New York and London. Housewife to the headhunter, Ursula Graham Vaz, a British debutante and dainty as a freshly laundered handkerchief has gone native among the head-hunting warrior tribes of remote Nargaland, where white woman has never ventured. Upon entering the primitive village, naked men lined her path, intending to stone her to death. But cool, courageous Miss Bauer kept on walking and kept her head. Spotting a man with a lacerated arm, she took out iodine and bandages from her fancy picnic basket. And, under the gaze of the village witch doctor, she saved the man's arm and her life. She won her battle and the villagers' respect. What? Poppycock! But, well, there were miracle cures. Miracles to the Nagas, at any rate. Mother was keen to get to remote villages with the simplest of medicines. Sapui, the headman says this <coughs> is the house of the sick woman. Oh, the poor woman. The air is very thick, and her hair is as coarse as a horse's tail. Oh, she's, she's recently given birth, delivered by the village women, by hand, hands caked in years of dirt. What choice do they have? If only it wasn't so dark in here. I have some white magic. is much more severe than I imagined. Let's see what we can do for her. <coughs> Iodine. Iodine. Lotion. Lotion. Don't worry. It will be all right. Dressing. Dress. 
Namaste. Be brave. That's the best I can do for her today. And in any case, Napkia, I think I may have to go outside for a moment. <coughs> 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 I don't think that poor woman will be. And how will she feed her baby? You have done well, my sister. The villagers are grateful. Very grateful. A few days later, I returned to the village to do a follow-up. But I couldn't find the mother or baby anywhere. Sapui, the baby is well, and his mother is as fit as a fiddle. <laughs> Thank the Lord for picnic baskets. <laughs> there is one thing, though. They say, they say with such magic, you must be guiding Lou. Oh, no. Not again. <sighs> And that's how Mother's life panned out for a while. Healing the sick, filming the Naga's crafts and customs, and trying not to be a part-time goddess. She became so accepted, they even allowed her in the men-only clubhouses in the village. She said, They seem to count me in on the Joan of Arc principle, that I'm not entirely... A lady. <laughs> and every so often, the press would have a field day. Hi there. I just filed this latest update at the post office. Ursula, queen of the jungle. No, the Narga queen. Yes, the Narga queen has turned a small corner of the wilderness into a place that is forever England. Fighting back the dense, encroaching vegetation, Miss Bower, housewife, headhunter, has cultivated her very own kitchen garden where she grows vegetables from seed. Potatoes, cabbages, and cauliflower now flourish in between rows of poles topped with gleaming white human skulls. The windows of her bamboo hut are adorned with chintz curtains and flower boxes. And from in between the geraniums, she can see her loyal Narga natives clearing a square of the jungle to create her very own personal croquet lawn. Really, where do they get it from? The trouble is, the real news is rather more compelling. Hitler's only just been and gone and done it. And what did Mother do when war broke out? She went to have her hair done. But when the Japanese came into neighbouring Burma, threatening to come through Nagaland into, into India, she took Namkia to see the British War Weapons Exhibition in Calcutta. <laughs> The British on the train were the first white people I had seen in months. How odd. I stared and stared. How knobbly and craggy the men looked. How pallid and ghastly the women seemed, like plants left in the dark. I couldn't stop gawking. They must have thought I was quite mad. <laughs> Meanwhile, Namkia, dressed in his Naga finery, was in another very crowded compartment, arousing much curiosity. He tried to answer the Indian's questions as best he could. No, I am not Indian. No, I am not Chinese. No, I am not a Tibetan. I am a Naga. Yes, we do sometimes chop off a man's head, but never on a train. <laughs> What's that? You say, are we cannibals? Now, well, let me see. I 
cannot remember the number of times I have eaten human flesh so many times. Oh, why do you edge away? In the last family, and a terrible family it was, my wife and I decided we would have to eat one of the children. No, no, don't be alarmed. We had four. <laughs> so we could not decide if we should eat the eldest. He was ten years old and had plenty of good meat on him, so we could always smoke him down. Or should we take the youngest? He was still a baby, so he was only small, and we would not miss him so much. And we could always have another baby later on. <laughs> well, we argued for hours. At last, I decided we would not kill the eldest. He had been so difficult to wear. It would be such a shame. And so, I killed the baby. Well, you cannot imagine the scene. I had not realized how fond my wife was of the baby. She cried and cried and would not eat one mouthful, which was really such a pity because it was most delicious, especially boiled with chilies. Hey, wait, where are you going? We naggers tell good stories. It is the only way to get a compartment to yourself. <laughs> Wake me when we get to the big city! Calcutta? Frighten the life out of Namkia. I had to keep an eye on him all the time. And I don't suppose the ladies' department of the army and navy stores will ever be the same again. But... By the time we got to the war weapons exhibition, he'd calmed down enough to take an interest in what the British had in hand should the Japs come flooding over the border. Gunagas hadn't been allowed guns since the guiding loo business, so his eyes were out on stalks of the latest advances in modern warfare. His favourite was the new machine gun. I got the firm impression that he and the Nagas would be spoiling for a fight with any Jap foolish enough to come their way. The Tommy gun is fine. Mm. But the ice cream is even finer. <laughs> I must take them home for my children. But now, here they melt. <sighs> and off he went to get another ice cream, leaving me quite unprotected for my next encounter. Hi there. Say, what's a girl like you doing in a warmongering giant like this? United Press Agency, ma'am, at your service, hoping to put in a little positive propaganda for the folks back home? I see. All too well, I saw. So, how about you, hey? Oh, no, wait, don't tell me. You've sacrificed the comforts of rural England to come to this hellhole to nurse the sick and wounded, a kind of angel of mercy amid the monsoons of war. Well, um, phew, you could put it that way if you really had to. You know, it's a real coincidence me meeting an English rose like you, because I've been reporting on the exploits of a country woman of yours. She's a real interesting gal. They call her the Narga Queen. Like me to tell you about her? Oh, well, I'm sure I'd be absolutely fascinated. Well, she commands a whole tribe of savages up in those Naga hills, and she thinks nothing of stripping herself naked, dorbing herself in war paint, and joining in their tribal dances. Only, I haven't put that in the article, because one has to consider taste. <laughs> and she's bound to come out of the hills sometime soon. And when she does, I'm going to meet her. Say, um, if you'd care to be a little sociable, um... Have dinner with me tonight. Perhaps I could uh, fix you up an introduction. I'm sure you'd get along just well. Oh. I feel as if I know her already. <laughs> but you know what? Now the Jeps are getting edgy on the border. It wouldn't surprise me if the Brits didn't ask those nuggers to act as native scouts to keep an eye out for any signs of invasion. Now, that is an idea. Just then, Nanki returned in a whirl of toucan feathers and vanilla. 
Um, it's, it's been an education meeting you, but, um, well, I really must get back to my nagas. Boiled head for tea? Good day. Hey, wait, whoa, hey, well, gee. The Japs have gone and bombed Pearl Harbor! Holy Samurai! Ah, oh, Miss Bauer. Henry here. Your offer is timely, very timely indeed. You clearly have some spot-on intelligence. Oh, more of a lucky guess, I suspect. But I'm perfectly sure my nagas will be jolly useful. Their jungle experience is second to none. And with suitable weapons, I'm sure they'd soon see off any marauding Japanese. Mm, that's um, not quite what HQ had in mind, actually. I see. And what did HQ have in mind? Actually, uh, there's a problem at Lumding. Lumding? But that's miles from our territory. Yes, I know. Well, we're collecting what refugees we can, British, Indian, Burmese, and we're taking them out train load by train load. But uh, when we get to Lumding Junction, they come head on with the troop trains going the other way. Hmm. A neat bit of... Planning, if I may say so. Mm. Confusion of war, I'm afraid. HQ simply didn't predict the chaos. Refugees arrive, tired, hungry, dying of thirst. And, well, get, simply get shunted into sidings. I see. Yes, they are a pitiful lot. Refugees usually are. Now, um... <clears throat> Uh, Shella, I've been instructed to invite you to take over the, um, railway canteen. The canteen? As best I can offer, I'm afraid. I mean, you'll be relieved as soon as possible, of course. Well, but, um, <clears throat> quite frankly, we don't know when the trains will stop coming. Oh, and, um, thank you. Ursula. <laughs> Henry out! Sapui! Are we going to fight now? No, Namkia, no. We're being sent a long way away to make cups of tea. But I don't suppose it will be much of a church supper. And then... The most extraordinary thing happened. Napka, whatever is the matter? And he threw himself at me, sobbing. <laughs> I want to come with you, but I must protect my family. They say this is not our war. We are not British. We are Nuggers. What has it got to do with us? But I have been with you for two whole years. How can I leave you? Oh, my sister... I am cut in two. Oh, Nankia. If you were to ask the ancestors, what would they say? I have spoken to them already. And they say, their bones lie in the field in Flanders, that it is my duty to be with you. But could you have a word with my wife first? <laughs> Of course, now here. I am all right. I am a warrior. Tomorrow I will fight with the tummy gun. Today I will fight with the teapot. <laughs> Our day begins at half past two in the morning when a messenger knocks on my window with a hopelessly inaccurate account of the day's figures. 
2,000 refugees comprising 40 to 50 Europeans, 200 Indians, and countless Burmese. 3 a.m. and the only cool hour of the 24, my team and I walk to the railway station with loads of bread and kindling on our backs. It is pitch black, but the silver railway lines shine in the moonlight. There are 60 gallons of water to boil, sandwiches to cut, mugs to be counted, and somewhere between 4 a.m., when the first smell of dawn comes in the air, and 5 a.m., when the birds start to sing in the trees, the first train comes in. Clacking over the points, the steam rattling in trees, the brown, sun-bleached, old-fashioned carriages jam-packed with so many people, tired, hungry, dying for thirst. The next two hours is one continuous whirl of fetching, pouring, serving, dishing, dashing, scolding and crises until at last we all collapse on the counter among the dirty dishes and tea-stained cups and watch the train go out again. Then everything has to be cleared up, cleaned up, washed and scrubbed until 10 a.m. when the wounded train arrives. Sapoi! So many men on stretchers. Their wounds are so bad they hide them for fear of upsetting our women. And yet, they wave and grin and say, thank you. Hands for the rosy lady. See you on the road, Baptists. Take it easy, miss. See you on the road to Mandalay. Sapoi! Those men are placing themselves like shields between the Nagas and the Japanese. And yet, they are so brave, so cheerful, so like us. This war is now a personal matter. We have a debt to repay. The Nuggers, the Nuggers are at your service. secretive. Even we don't know who we are. <laughs> but God, would you look at those hills? Verdant forests, infinite ridges, lifting, melting, merging. Colour of apricot at dawn, reddening now in the setting sun. Oh, setting sun. Better get a bloody move on. Oh, oh. Sapui, Sapui, there is a man who is not a man. He comes up the mountain on all fours, a tiger. And he says not one word, not one. Another man would be whipping by now. The courage, and he is looking for you. And it seems I found you, Miss Bower, I presume. Quite correct. Mm. Oh, thank God for that. Thought you'd.
you'd be a lady missionary with creaking stays. <laughs> the name's Rawd and Wright, and I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. Heard a lot about you. Met your mother once a couple of years back. As a do in, in Kensington. Good God, yes. Another world away. Well, uh, come to ask you a favour. The force have sent me to recruit scouts. We need to intercept the Japs coming this way. So, how about encouraging your Nagas into a watch and ward operation? Me? Why not? Your best place. You have their trust. And you have a legend on your side. Of course, um, I have to send one of my chaps uh, to take charge. No. No chap. If we are to work for the British, then we would be proud to be led by the Sapui. The Sapui, and only the Sapui. She will be our leader. Well, that's highly irregular. You want guns, I suppose. Well, uh, it would be essential for the British Army to show a d degree of trust in its new recruits. Hmm. Snag is that'll make you the only female combatant officer in the entire Allied force. So, I'll get HQ to put you down as a typist. <laughs> Let's hope you're right about the guns. If not, you'll be wrong twice. Once for being wrong and once for being a woman. Namkia offered to make... Rawdon Wright a litter to help him continue on his trek. He refused point blank, of course. He fell several times on the steep descent from Mother's Camp, and then he fell ill. That last gesture, well, it had just been too much for him. My grandparents sent their condolences. And when Japanese reconnaissance parties started to appear, the Nagas silently stalked them, like a game of chess, defending the White Queen's castle. Well, we used the railway telephone for communication. We didn't know who'd be listening, so we devised a code. One elephant meant that ten Japs had been seen in the area, and it worked a treat until some coolie turned up at Lumding Junction with a dozen genuine elephants. <laughs> but by all reports, the Japs were getting uncomfortably close and had started shooting at our planes. Suddenly, we found ourselves in a kind of mountain rescue operation. My American friend was jolly excited about that. At a military hospital in Calcutta, I found a British pilot with a story to tell. Shut down by the Japs, he crash-landed in the jungle. He was injured pretty bad. He just lay there waiting for the Japs to find him. He'd heard about their techniques. Next thing, a shadow had fallen over his face. Eight, maybe ten, short, stocky men were leaning over him, wearing necklaces and earrings. He remembered thinking, Christ, Japs in fancy dress. <laughs> Without a word, the strangers lifted him onto a primitive stretcher and carried him for two days through the jungle until they reached a line of native huts on a ridge. The light was real bad, but he could feel someone treating his wounds. A beautiful white Woman. Jeez, that dame gets everywhere. And you know what's so great about that story? It's true. Every goddamn word. Even I couldn't make that up. The Japanese actually put a price on Mother's head. When she got wind of it, she arranged with Namkia that... If they got too close for comfort, he should shoot her and present her head to the Japanese. 
my mother, so that they would leave the village in peace. Oh, my mother. Sapui! Sapui! A message! A message! Ten elephants, short and armed with black hair, are advancing down the valley two days from here. That's a hundred men, and we have very few. It would not be a battle of equals, so I am thinking this might be a very good time to resign. <laughs> resign? Yes. In the British Army, you have something called annual leave, yes? Well, I am thinking that all Nagas should take annual leave and go home to their families. Sapui, come with us. No, Namkia, no. I have orders to hang on here as long as I can. HQ need to know where the enemy is, so hang on I will to raise the alarm. But it doesn't take all of us to send one signal. You must go. After all, it's not really your war. And, and take the weapons. And off they went, home to their wives and children, leaving me hurled out here, not entirely undefended. Oh. I can scarcely blame them, I suppose. We've all been living like gazelles with lions around for weeks. The Nagas were born to be scouts, not dug into the front line like rats in a trap. They weren't armed for combat, trained for it even, just thrown at it willy-nilly overnight by me. <laughs> gave his life for this. And now I must give mine. Oh, oh. 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 Namkia, I really am frightened. You don't know how much you're going to miss someone until they're not here. Who's there? Who is there? Oh, oh this is ridiculous. Thank you. Are you back? Of course, Sapoi. Oh, uh, I thought you'd gone home. We have been home, and now I am back to be with you. We went to make our wills and to give our ancestral necklaces to our sons. I gave my grandfather's spear to my eldest, and he is delighted with it. <laughs> and we arranged with the headman for the welfare of our families. <laughs> oh, Sapui, do not cry. How could we abandon you to face danger alone? How could we leave you and live to hear our children called son of a coward, son of a coward? Better we stay here and die with you and have our children proud of their ancestors. Now, you take the tummy gun. Give me the trowel. <laughs> Tomorrow, we take heads. At the risk of ruining a good story, the Japanese never did make it to Laisong. They met the Allied forces some 60 miles north at Kohima, and one of the most ferocious battles of World War II ensued. At one point, enemy lines faced each other across a tennis court. Nagas lost their lives alongside our, our 14th Army. The battle lasted for three months, and was a crucial turning point in the war. But now, now it's time to meet Daddy. <coughs> um, um, Colonel 
Timothy Betts reporting, sir. <laughs> Seeking permission to, um, to reconnoitre the Nalga Queen, sir, with a, with a view to matrimony. <laughs> um, with the um, war uh, as good as over, <laughs> well, I've, I've heard that um, the, the Yanks have something rather nasty up their sleeve to finish the, the Japs off with. Well, I, I'm a bit of a loose end, and, um, well, um, if I ever am going to get to get married, I thought it was a good time to do a bit of a recce, sir. I, I, is that all, all right, sir? I mean, I'd, I'd um, try to improve my collection as well, sir. Um, I'm a gather. It's a famous country up there, and I'm a bit of a collector on the quiet. I, I, I believe there's some Kali Naga Buddha Buddha floating about. So, um, I mean, if the um, if the the main object should should prove unwilling, then um, I won't have entirely wasted my time, sir. I I I'm just waiting for you to give permission, sir. Is that all right, sir? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, you'll have to keep an eye on the cake in the oven. I'll go and meet him. It's your favourite napkin, Victoria Sponge. Oh, there you are, Kylo. How can I help? Um, I'd um, just like to stay for a few days to um, improve my collection. Oh. Well, there's plenty of room. I expect you'll want to spend all day in the hills, so um, just let me know when you want a packed lunch. Goodbye. <sighs> well, you best get a, a move on. The chill's usually off around ten-ish, and your prey will be often flitting about. <laughs> skulking around the camp, unless there's something else? There is, actually. Well, be quick about it. Um, well, um, I would like to marry you. I beg your pardon? Will you marry me? But I was seen to a cake. And that's how I found myself on the business end of a proposal of marriage. Well, what answer would you give? He looked exactly the sort of chap who'd been hit over the head with a blunt instrument and only proposed because he'd run out of any other conversation. I barely met him. I don't believe a word of that butterfly nonsense. Should I really say yes? Henry, <laughs> Mrs. Henry, actually. Oh, my dear. Henry and I barely knew each other when we were wed. And see how happy we are. <laughs> Marriage is such a gamble. You may as well go ahead. 
The shelf beckons. <laughs> so, marry along the Nani Swain and be done with it. <laughs> and I'll walk you up an aisle. If there is an aisle, Henry out. <laughs> Well, then. Yes! <laughs> ooh. 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 <laughs> I was being kissed in blazes, and to my intense surprise, because I'd hitherto thought it a nauseating and overrated pastime. I was rather enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> the plunge commotion brought Nancy running with his dow drawn. It's all right, Nancia. The Colonel and I are um, going to be married. <laughs> well, I've never seen him faint before. <laughs> mm-hmm. A British Colonel pays eight pounds for a bride who burnt a cake. By some unfathomable miracle, a crisp white wedding dress appeared from within the deep, dark jungle. And a wedding cake and wine. Two proud Nargas stood on either side of the church door. Namkyo, the <laughs> Queen's bodyguard, displayed his newly acquired British Empire medal, his queen, her MBE. The bride and groom solemnly shared a meal from the same wooden platter, and so the union was formalized according to ancient Narga lore. Suddenly, the mood changed. Armed to their teeth, her loyal subjects lined in pensive, serried ranks before her. Namkir, the queen's bodyguard, stepped forward. Sapui, the tribe delivers its judgment. The sahib, the sahib is all right. Let us dance. written in laboured script with news of her beloved land. Some of it was, was deeply distressing. When I was born in 1951, news of my birth was relayed back to the Naga Hills, and a very senior Naga walked for mile upon mile to a post office to send me a parcel. 
ceremonial costume and a note dearest little one we have named you Hai Hangele which means which means a hundred times welcome and when you cry we shall hear you and when you laugh we shall smile and when you dance, the flames of our campfire shall flicker for one day. Mother told me the stories, of course, but neither of us anticipated the, the responsibility to come. <laughs> I am General Mo, Commander-in-Chief of the Naga National Army, and I am also very proud to be your uncle. <laughs> uncle Mo? And you've come all the way from, from Nagaland? <laughs> yes. I am here to seek your mother's assistance. Are there big snarly tigers in Nagaland, like, like Mummy says? Yes. Very big tigers with very big snarls and even greater growls. And butterflies as big as platters and trees that reach to the sky and bright birds that sing to the moon and leopards with spots as black as ink. Mummy said... A leopard came sniffing round her hut one night. It did indeed, but it dare not eat her. Hi, Hangale. During the big war, your mother was known by the Allies as the Naga Queen. Yes, I know. Daddy told me. <laughs> well, it was only in smiles, of course, a white man smile. But now we need a queen to speak for us. And little one, if your mother is the Naga queen, then you must be the Naga princess. Me? A princess? A Naga princess? <laughs> yes. And one day you will come to Nagaland. And one day 
you will meet your Naga brothers and sisters, and one day, Hai Hangale, you will help us. But now, I must speak to your mother. Oh. Golly! Oh. Trina, you must listen very carefully to everything Uncle Mo says to Mummy. And then, then you must tell it all to Hai Hangale. You understand? <laughs> General Mo, what a pleasure to meet you. Safe journey. Sapui, our nation is weeping, and you must dry its eyes. You must understand I have the greatest respect for the British. The British and only the British conquered our land, and my people proudly bowed to your protection. When the Japanese invaded, they failed. I, Mo, was the youngest stretcher bearer at the Battle of Kohima, a 13-year-old, a boy with bamboo and canvas, my stretcher and angel's wing. And we beat them. We faced them across a tennis court. And we beat them. Sapui, how do you say? Game set and match. <laughs> but now I have another story to tell. When the British left in haste, they gave India her independence. But they did not give Nagaland our independence, no. They gave us to India, but we were never conquered by India. We are not Indian, and we will never be a part of India. We are Nagas. We want to be free, but to seek independence is to rattle a fist at authority. India does not like it. First, he humiliated us whittling away at our culture, whittled like a boy with a stick. But now she is destroying us. The newspaper men have been banned from Nagaland, so they know nothing about the atrocities against my people, Sapoi, our people. India sends soldiers, not warriors, butchers. I have reports. February 13th, 1955, a battalion of Indian soldiers surrounds a Naga village. The villagers are assembled and beaten. Women and girls stripped, tied to posts and raped until they collapse unconscious. The Nagas did nothing. February 28th, an Indian force comes to where a woman is about to give birth. She is beaten with rifle butts, kicked in the stomach. The baby is born dead. The Nagas did nothing. April 5th. Two Nagas and their wives are arrested and tied to trees. The wives are asked how they would like to see their husbands killed. The Nagas did nothing. They loot our grain stores, torch our villages. No longer can the Nagas do nothing. Sapui, we need your help. We need a war of words here in the West. Oh, we will all die. No, 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 I hang the leg, I hang the leg, I hang the leg.
always as they seem, are they? What am I doing paddling up the chin wind with a notebook and camera? I owe a dame a favor, that's why. I just spent three weeks hanging around Rangoon Zoo, somewhere between the giraffe enclosure and the monkey house, pretending to be a tourist. The Narga Queen arranged for an emissary to fix me up this trip to Nargaland. By the time he turned up, I got through a hell of a lot of bananas feeding those apes. My editor seems to think the Indians have been bombing Nargra villages. Of course, they deny it. Rumor has it, the, Indi the Nargas have shut down an Indian DC-3. So, I get my picture. The Narga Queen gets her proof. My editor gets his story, and I get a raise. <sighs> Funny thing is, I feel like a new man as if before I'd been a kid shadow boxing. Now I'm a warrior too, a warrior of truth. That was my last story. No need to embroider this one. But when they printed it, no one took a blind bit of notice. Every government in the West wanted to trade with India. So, no one wanted to rock the boat. I just hung up my hat. This newspaper man is going out of circulation. So long. <laughs> to think that Mother's war of words made a difference. She tried desperately to alert the world to the plight of the Nagas. She hounded the press. She appeared on the home service. She wrote a book that, that no one would publish because of the, the truths it told. And then she was followed by the Indian Intelligence Service for, for telling those truths. She tried to go back. Desperately she tried. But the Indians banned her, called her a foreigner. The Nagas were her people and she was a foreigner. And all the time the, the Naga culture was being whittled away. And Mother... Mother? Mother couldn't go back, but I could. It wasn't a case of going down to Thomas Cook and booking a cosy tour, not to a closed country. It was a difficult journey, to say the least. There were to be two 18-hour bus trips. I had no concept of the distance involved, otherwise I would have gone before I set off. I was about to start on the adventure of a lifetime, dying for a wee. <laughs> the seats on the bus were the most antique you could imagine, bits of metal getting into my most sensitive of places. I never told Mother I was planning to follow in her footsteps. But, but somehow, she was with me all the way. <coughs> and bustled along the road through really thick, low country jungle, morning mist still lingering in places. We pulled up at a sentry post to show our papers. Fifty years later, I had to hide under a sack in the back of the jeep. Thank you. Huge walls of great trees on either side, all straining up for the daylight, and creepers tangled in between, and shadows of men underneath those creepers. For goodness sake, who are those? Indian soldiers, of course, in full battle dress, with machine guns. 
I'd never seen the like. Suddenly we began to climb, zigzag, 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 the whole way up. We were still climbing when we came round a bend and... And both our lives changed forever. For there. Coming towards us. A huge convoy of military vehicles. Grey and sinister, snaking its way down the road. Its windscreen wipers smearing a cruel grin. The grin of a goddess. Its dim headlamps like yellow eyes. The yellow eyes of a python. itself, the Nagas couldn't have been nicer. After walking 20 kilometres up and down Mother's accordion, accordion fleeting I was, as you might imagine, quite exhausted, there was one last climb up to the village itself which I just couldn't contemplate. Seeing my distress they said, don't worry, we'll get the village helicopter for you. I thought, what? Well, it turned out to be a plastic chair with two bamboo poles on the shoulders of four gorgeous young men. I loved it, but they complained I was rather heavy. I went to a meeting of Naga elders. who were all sitting around the room in passive mood. Dressed in their vivid red and black cloaks with faces carved out of dark wood. And it was a meeting where there was no paper, no obvious chairman, no minutes. And yet everything happened to order and everything was satisfactorily resolved. And I promised to pick up their campaign, to continue their war of words, because throughout my entire visit there was one simple underlying message. Hi Hangale, you are home. <laughs> Lysanke has doubled in size, but the old parts still retain their original character. After the ceasefire in 1997, the, the Naga communities began to focus more on the benefits of economic development than the principles of politics. So, um, there are several schools, solar panels, and um, even a mobile phone mast. Though, the only road to the village is still painful on the posterior. Mother is still remembered with great affection. These old ladies recall her from their childhood. Oh, that's me meeting an old woman who can still sing the Scottish song Mother played on her gramophone. And there is a memorial building, half library, half guest house, that bears her name, which is actually very moving considering it's been 70 years since she was there. I've been back oh, many times since and have always been made extraordinarily welcome. Oh, it's such a colourful, vibrant place. And things have settled down so much now, this story can finally be told. I'm going back again at Christmas. And I'm taking this play with me to be performed in the villages my mother loved so much.
Likes, please.